I'm Katie Wilcox, Business Administrator at Society for the Environment, and I'm delighted to welcome you to a special episode in our podcast series, ENVCAST, Environmental Professionals in Conversation. In the UK and beyond, the Society for the Environment champions World Environment Day, a UN initiative which takes place on the 5th of June each year. World Environment Day provides a platform for global education and inspiration, shining attention on a particularly pressing environmental theme. This year, the global theme for World Environment Day is Ecosystem Restoration, launching the UN's Decade on Ecosystem Restoration 2021 to 2030. Chartered environmentalists are in agreement that urgent action is needed to restore our ecosystems and the impact that everyday actions can make towards achieving this. Why not check out our recently launched website hub developed in collaboration with key partners? Here you will find tons of information and inspirational resources on the importance of restoring our ecosystems and what we can all do to help. To get involved, visit socem.org.uk forward slash ecosystem restoration. To kick things off, I'm pleased to introduce Dougal Driver CM, Vice Chair of the Society for the Environment, who will be conducting this month's interview. Dougal is a Chartered Environmentalist via the Institute of Chartered Foresters. Among his many roles, he is Chief Executive of Grown in Britain, focusing on supporting our homegrown forest product supply chains. He also chairs several forestry committees, advice ministers, wildlife trusts and private companies on organisational and environmental strategies. In addition, Dougal is the World Environment Day lead at the Society, which makes him the ideal chair for this special episode of the podcast. I am also delighted to introduce today's interviewee, Tamsin morris CM. It is great to have her on the podcast. Tamsin is a partner at Walking the Talk, an environmental consultancy based in rural Aberdeenshire with coverage across Scotland. Tamsin has worked in the Scottish land management sector for 25 years and has been a self-employed ecologist for 14 years, with experience in agricultural and environmental sectors in Scotland. She specialises in agri-environment projects, peatland restoration, ecological assessments, plant and freshwater ecology and communicating environmental issues to the wider public, whilst working with a range of clients in the public, private and voluntary sectors. Welcome to Dougal and Tamsin. I will now hand over to Dougal for the interview. Well, Tamsin, it's great to meet you. Um, we have such a cadre of environmentalists within the society who perform professional roles all over the world. So it's great to meet uh, meet you and to hear about what you what you do, what you do for your profession, what you do in your life, but also how it connects to World Environment Day 2021. So it's a very open first question. Just just tell us a little bit about uh, what you do in your in your current role, please. Um, so I'm based in, in Aberdeenshire in, in Scotland, which you may be able to tell from the glorious weather that we have for you outside the window there. Um, I, think, I think we've currently forgotten that it's spring. Um, so I'm a, I'm a self-employed ecologist. Um, I've been freelance since about 2008. Uh, I work in a, a business that we call Walking the Talk, um, which is a partnership between me and a colleague. Um, and I cover a whole range, really, of different ecological subjects across, predominantly across Scotland at the moment. Um, and so, yeah, we, we deliberately called the business Walking the Talk because we felt that that the time had come to stop talking the talk and start walking the talk. So that's 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 who I am. Um, prior to that, I worked for the Scottish Environment Protection Agency for a while. And before that, I worked on a river catchment project that was looking at river restoration here in Aberdeenshire. So being an ecologist, I guess the theme for World Environment Day this year, ecosystems restoration, is, is something that you've been practising in various guises throughout your career. Um, do you feel it's more, in, more of an imperative now than when you started? I think it's good that now the word ecosystem restoration is starting to sound like something you might hear on, on the news at 10, and not like something that you would just find in, in obscure lecture notes from, from my ecology degree. You know, I think it's it's finally become something that people are starting to understand as a as a concept and realise that we can't fix individual components without looking at the whole. So it's become a bit more like looking at a car engine and saying, OK, how is the whole thing working together? And I think I think that's a real step forward because we've realised that we're dependent on the outcomes of some of those ecosystems so we can't just tinker around with a little bit and go, oh, well, we seem to have broken that bit. Never mind, doesn't matter because we actually need some of the outputs. So I think it, I think it's always been an imperative, but I think it's become something that as a society we are maybe becoming more aware of, which is great from my point of view personally because it means people don't look at me like I've got 
two wellies on my head when I try and explain what my job is. You know, finally yeah. starting to it, nod rather than looking confused. It does help, doesn't it, when you feel like you're not pushing the water always up the hill where someone yes. is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. People aren't I mean, still what, going. What's that? You're a psychologist, and I keep going ecologist. Yeah, so, ecologist. Yeah. I guess also it must be quite quite well reassuring might be the wrong word given that we do have a bit of a crisis on our hands but the fact that the united nations have recognized this globally so it's you're not only you you, you you don't have you don't you can you might need to persuade people where you work in the uk but actually this is part of a, a global issue that's recognized at the very highest level so there's no there's, there's no excuses for people you might be trying to persuade. Do you do you feel much more emboldened to push open those doors and take their prisoners now around this subject? Um, I think possibly I was always a bit too emboldened, and that's why I ended up self-employed. But um, <laughs> I think it is easier now because I think not only is is society recognizing this as something that we we need, society is also starting to recognize that we may have to pay for some of that. And that inevitably helps the conversations because it's very difficult to ask people to to do something that they feel they aren't being either recognised or recompensed for. And I think now that society is starting to say, hey, do you know what, guys, we actually we need these ecosystems and they need to be functioning. I think it's easier to have those conversations and say to people, this is this would be your role in it. And this is how this is how society would value it. And I think that will only increase as time goes on. So are you, are you very hopeful about the future? Do you feel that we're on, uh, the, the United Nations have talked about uh, a decade of ecosystems restoration. Do you, do you feel this is uh, something that could look very different in 10 years' time? I think in some places it could. I think in other places there's always going to be, it, it's it's like turning the, the super tank around. That's always going to take a long time. So there are there are there are geographical areas, I would say, and parts of the economy that are starting to recognise this and and really run with it. But I think there are other areas that perhaps aren't so much, and that that change in mindset is is going to always be something that takes up takes a while, becomes almost a generational thing. I think, but I do think when you look, and I know it's quite a cliched thing to say, but I do think. When you look at, at young people, they are so much more switched on, and that that inevitably is going to move through as people like me get old and crusty and put out to grass. Then you know that's going to start to to filter through. I think, but I, I think time I think time is not time is against us because we're late to the party. So you know we we need to get a move on. Just sort of take you back, um, come out of the sort of global context, and just sort of take you back into. What were some of the influences that got you into the sector? What is it, you know, because you mentioned young people there. What is it that made you think this is what I, this is something I want to do for a living? Um, I guess I had a pretty rural upbringing. Um, so I grew up in the countryside and I was outside a lot. So that that was always part of it. But actually, I think I had I had quite inspirational geography teachers. And I know that that sounds like a phrase you never hear because geography teachers, you know, they wear elbow patches and they're never inspirational. But mine actually were. And they they talked a lot about, not just about what we think of the traditional geography in terms of this is where the glaciers went and this is the capital of so-and-so, but also in terms of some of the kind of global issues, things like soil erosion, climate change, things that kind of weren't, you know, weren't on the news at that stage. And I, I found that really interesting. And then I worked, um, before I went to university, I had a year um, where I worked as a volunteer for the local wildlife trust, which I just absolutely loved. I had a great time and they were amazing with me. They they let me try all sorts of things and, and you know, have a go at everything basically. And that that really enthused me. And I think it was a good job I did that because it helped me get through kind of three years of study and the sort of maybe slightly drier academic side of things. And is there, is there a particular aspect of ecology that you found the most interesting as you've built your career? I guess it's very much upland ecology, um, which is probably not a surprise living living in the north of Scotland. Um, so that's, that's what I found interesting and seeing how the land management, because it's happening on such a big scale in a way within Scotland. I know that's not on a big global scale, but I know on a, on a I kind of enjoy being able to look at things across a big chunk of land and look at how the different factors, you know, the grazing or the way it's being managed is affecting the is affecting the ecosystem. I find that 
that sort of large scale approach interesting. And have you found it easy to make a difference in that environment? Do you, you, you find that you, you, when you have the conversations with, um, well, I guess clients, the regulators, uh, the landowners, the, the opposition, I'm sure there's always opposition at some point, do you find that your professional view is uh, not only heard but acted upon? I think that's changed probably over the last few years. I think people have started to, I think it's gone from being something that sounds a bit woolly and a bit cuddly. And oh yes, that'd be lovely to do. And we've got a little tiny paddock out the back here. We could we could do something there, ignoring the other, you know, 4,000 hectares of estates. Yeah. Um, and I think it's now becoming becoming something that people are prepared to have more of a conversation about because I think people can see the kind of global change and the political change and so you know I don't think it's that I've suddenly in the last few years become much more authoritative sounding I think it's because people are seeing the kind of the way that the the, the mindset is starting to change but I mean not always you know there are people who who still view it as something very nice and cuddly and it'd be lovely to have a car sticker that says that but I don't really actually want to do anything and then you get other people who are saying okay what can I what can I make from this how can I how can I benefit from this but how can I also manage my land in such a way that I'm not behind the curve yeah now you've got you've got a long career ahead of you Tamsin um, <laughs> but and, uh, many many years decade you know decorations de- decorations uh, <laughs> no uh, definitely decades de- <laughs> To date, what would be a few things you'd pick out as some of your major major successes uh, from your efforts as a professional? And don't you know, spare your blushes. Um, what's 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 the things you look back and you think you know I I, I did that you know just to pick out a few. I guess there are things from I said um, when I when I first moved to Aberdeenshire, I was working on a, a river catchment project. So so hard though this will be to believe that was twenty years ago. Um, and so I still live in that river catchment. Um, so some of the trees and things we planted, they're proper trees now, you know, <laughs> they're making a difference. They're actually, they're putting out shade. They're doing the things that we, that we were looking to do 20 years ago. And this is a, this is a river that's in, it's in a kind of lowland part of Aberdeenshire. So relatively agricultural landscape, not so many trees. Um, so that's, that's nice. And it's not, it's not rocket science. You know, everybody's been planting trees, but it it's one of the advantages, I guess, of, of getting uh, older and seeing the seeing the change. You know, seeing I might, that. I might just argue about the rocket science being a forester. I think it's incredibly complex. <laughs> okay. um, uh, people will laugh at you when they when, when they hear me asking you that question, and that's your answer. Um, I can assure anybody listening that that wasn't staged because trees are my life. Um, so the nature based solutions for you was which is what we all call it now, and mm-hmm. uh, natural um, flood management, et cetera, which you were doing that a long time ago before those words were even yes. probably we written down on a document somewhere. Yes, we didn't call it that. We called it tree planting next to the river. Planting trees. <laughs> and shade. we called it, yes, and we called it buffer strips. We didn't call it natural flood management, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but but those things you do see, because I, I, I pass through that area every day, I, I do see the, the difference in those things. And, and, and that's nice because, you know, it hasn't been that long. So so those things are good. There's other river restoration projects that I've worked on in, in urban areas that are nice to see more from a kind of recreation point of view, to be honest. I mean, I don't think when you look at a small urban burn in the middle of Aberdeen City, you know, yes, hopefully we've slightly improved water quality and we've probably slightly reduced flood impact, but it's it, on a global scale, it's, it's pretty minimal. But what we have got from some of those is some amazing recreational resources. And it's really nice to see the, the local communities who were perhaps a bit suspicious at the start to see them really valuing those areas and, and enjoying the fact that rather than having, you know, mown grassland that's that's rye grass and mown within an inch of its mm. life they've got patches of wildflowers and things and people seeing that and and enjoying that and starting to value that so so that's although I don't think that's like I say I don't think that's saving the planet necessarily it's nice to see people starting to value areas like that 
I think the role, I think I, I get I realize where you where you sort of slightly you know took the edge off the impact of what you've done there but actually you know if you do something in the in the wilds that nobody sees it, it is what it is it's important and it has the impact if you do something engaging with people and communities then there's every chance that it's exponential isn't it because they 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 absorb what what they see and the benefits and they pass that on i think i think it's really important that chartered environmentalists in particular engage with people and don't just sort of do their job in isolation and that that's the way to have the, the impact um sorry that's just that's just my view and listening to what you're saying i've got to ask you about um a very brilliant way of managing uh, natural environments in catchments, which is um, using beavers. I, I, I'm sure you've. Uh, I, 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 I just want to get your opinion on something that uh, has not been uncontroversial. Um, I've got a bit of a history myself. In in before it was thought of back here, I did tour Europe to look at the impact. Um, and so I, I have to declare an interest that I'm very pleased that even that, even though my first profession is forestry and people have questioned it from that sector. But from an ecologist point of view, and you've mentioned water catchments and nature-based solutions, what do you think about beavers coming back into particularly Scotland, but they're of course across the UK? Now? Yeah, I mean, they are, a, they are a massive political hot potato up here. Um, I think, I think... On Radio Scotland, at some point, they said at the the NF the National Farmers Union for Scotland conference one year, beavers were a bigger topic than Brexit. So, <laughs> you know, they're 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 a big deal here. I think where they are in in systems that aren't heavily managed, I think it's an amazing thing, and I think it's absolutely the way forward. I guess I have some concerns as to how we manage it in the long term, where you are trying. I guess from an ecosystem point of view, what we're trying to do is is reintroduce a degree of naturalization by reintroducing the beaver, but we're still managing, we're not putting it back to a completely natural ecosystem. We're not walking away. We're still trying to manage it for certain outcomes. And I think we're going to have a bit of a rocky road for a while whilst we work out how do those outcomes all, all work together. And there's part of me that says it would be great if we could just put beavers back, put wolves back, walk away. You know, we deal with the deer problem. We get everything, everything sorted. But life's not like that. You know, we all need to eat and so on. So, so we've got to work out a way that those different land uses can can work together. And I'm not sure that we've quite got to the point where we we quite know how that's going to work. And I think it will come out come out in the wash, so to speak. Excuse the pun. But you know, I think I think over time we'll we'll all figure it out. But I think I think it, we just need to be a little bit careful in the next few years that we don't alienate people by reintroducing one aspect of an ecosystem whilst trying to maintain all the rest of the ecosystem in exactly the same format, because I don't, I don't know that we can do that. I don't know that the beavers can do that. You know, it's not reasonable to say to a beaver, okay, <laughs> you can make a dam over there, but do not go over there, you know? Um, yeah. And that's, that's the bit that we need to just kind of feel our way around a bit, I think. Whereas when you're in the, you know, higher up in the hills, further away from the sort of, managed agricultural landscape it, it's it's an easier thing i think and it's you know great to see them there Tamsin, just talking there about you know reintroducing species that have maybe gone out of landscapes is it plays into the global theme of ecosystems restoration and it it also plays into the fact that we're trying to re, you know when you use the word reintroduction it's things that man has removed from that ecosystem i mean it, how, do you feel that restoration is possible to sort of go back to how things were or is, is restoration quite the right word because one one might argue that it's impossible to go back and put all these mm -hmm. things back in place and expect the the whole jigsaw puzzle picture to look as it should yes and i think maybe i'm more of a fan of the kind of rewilding word which is perhaps maybe acknowledging that that we're not going to get all the way back to how it was 1500 years ago that that we can't we can't do that with the number of people that we have right now so so we have to acknowledge that yes we can we can restore elements of an ecosystem and we can hopefully focus on restoring elements from a from a selfish point of view we can restore elements that that are of benefit to humans so whether that's flood management or whatever it is but we're never going to be able to put things back to how they were before you know 
William the Conqueror and, and things like that. We, you know, too much has changed. And, and we don't have that freedom. You know, we don't have the opportunity to reintroduce wolves in Scotland to, to manage the deer population. That's that's not going to happen. So, well, in my, my lifetime anyway. So so we have to acknowledge that some aspects of, of restoring things, we are going to have to manage ourselves. So we have to manage the deer population as, as, as humans, as our contribution, if you like, to that ecosystem. We need to accept we can't just have deer all across the uplands. We need to manage that. And, and the, the, the natural, the totally restored way would be to chuck in a load of wolves and walk away. That's not going to happen. So we've got to work out how can we manage that process and get that ecosystem as close as we can to natural, but whilst acknowledging that it's never going to be, it's never going to be, you know, humans are always going to be a part of it. Yeah, I, I can imagine this. You, you come across <laughs> resistance uh, in a lot of the things that a, a you do, but also you're, you're talking about. I mean, do you think we put our case across as well as we should from the environmental sector? What might we do differently if you if you agree with me? I think we sometimes I think a lot of the time we're too technical, a lot of the time. And I think maybe that's slightly less important than it used to be, because, like I say, people know what ecology is now, whereas, you know, 20 years ago, they maybe it wasn't so clear. But I think we are we are always guilty of being too technical. And I think it's a it's almost a badge of honour. Sometimes it feels to make sure you've got some technical words in there. And I don't I don't think that helps us. Mm. And I think I think some of it is just down to just listening to the other point of view and being being open to that and I think sometimes sometimes we're all guilty of, of not listening to the other side so to speak and the other side is the same with us you know there's that there's that you know sometimes you have that thing where somebody says something but you hear something completely different and I think I think you can only sort of work through that by being reasonably personable and polite and, and accepting that some things will take time and that some things some things you can't change but look at the things that you can change uh, you know, inevitably, there are always people who say, you know, no. Uh, you yeah. know, and it's it's then looking for the where's the wee chink. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think I think that we I think we do need to um, as professionals. I do think we need to not see that as uh, you know we need to therefore be professional at mm -hmm. all times with all people. Um, and actually, I think in particular. Enchanted environmentalists do something that is about engaging with people. I, you know, I know it's it's about the environment, but actually uh, the two things are so intertwined. It is possible, and someone might argue me to be in a profession where you don't need to do much of that. Maybe, mm. uh, maybe you're, you know, you're not, you you you, you really are office bound, and you're you're literally dealing with inanimate objects or spreadsheets or whatever. But we're dealing with organic aspects of life aren't we and um, the interaction therefore with people is inevitable I want to link that into something you said earlier about young people and young people coming into the profession do you do you see enough of that um, and I'm going to link it to diversity and inclusivity as well a little bit if you want to bring that out in your answer do you see enough of it what could we do differently I think I do see I see young and very competent people wanting to get into the profession and that then that's brilliant I see a lot of people who get put off because it's difficult to get into as a professional. And this is more how it was when I when I started sort of in the late 90s, there was kind of it was very, very hard to get. There weren't that many jobs. It was very hard to get a job. You had to do some sort of voluntary work. That's fine if you've got a way of supporting yourself through that. And, and it was it was definitely, definitely quite exclusive. Um I don't mean that in terms of the people who are doing it were amazing. I mean that in terms of excluding a lot of people. Um, and I feel a little bit like we're coming back round to that because I suppose maybe there are more environmental jobs out there at the moment, but there are maybe more people applying for them. There's more interest. COVID hasn't helped any of that. Um, so I do think, I do worry that, that we end up in that situation again where you can be an environmental professional if you can afford it in the first place. And that obviously doesn't help in terms of diversity. I would have to say that diversity in ecology is not is not a great thing. Um, whenever I go to conferences, you know, you don't look at the room and go, wow, that's a diverse room. Yeah. Um, so I do think we have an issue there. And it, it disappoints me slightly, I suppose, that 
it feels like this is how it was in the 90s. I'd be sad if we came back to that place again just because of the kind of external economic pressures. So, so I think we need to try, you know, those of us that have been around for donkey's years need to try and make sure there are opportunities for young people that that don't just kind of take advantage of the fact that they they are maybe looking for that experience and don't say oh well you can do this as a volunteer you know I think I think we need to be better than that yeah just dig into the barriers to that then a little bit because you, you took some responsibility there as, as I do and the society does as well um supporting diversity and sustainability initiative that's uh, uh, in and around the sector at the moment um but I think the, you know you've got to act, haven't you? Um, what what would make a difference? Do you think? And I know there's not one answer to that question, but I'm really intrigued to know what you think we might do differently. You're, you're picking up on your walking the talk. Uh, yes. Uh, you're, you're literally your the name on your shirt. Mm -hmm. um, what can what can we do to make a difference then? Yeah, I mean, I think I think what we have. I mean, we're obviously a pretty small business, but what we've tried to do is make sure. We, we wouldn't look to young people to do any of the roles that we might need on a voluntary basis. Even if you're doing something that might be really useful experience and might not be, it might not be rocket science. It might not be the most complicated part of our job. I don't think it's ever appropriate to say to somebody, you come and do the same job as I'm doing, but you can do it for free because you need the experience. Um, I, I just don't, I, and I, th I mean, I'm aware that's what I did for the first year, but I, I, I was able to do that you know my parents were content for me to live at home for another year um happy might be overstating it um so so I think we need to be aware of that and I think we need to from what I see from some of the bigger consultancies and the big companies is that I think there is a tendency for young people to be exploited is maybe too harsh a word but maybe unrealistic expectations of what people can do in terms of long hours because they should be glad that they've got a job that, yeah. again I don't think I don't think that's okay and I think you have to acknowledge that you know just because you, you're young and looking for experience doesn't mean you can be treated you can yeah. be treated badly I mean that, that that aspiration you know see for everybody to be able to see that they can make a good career and you know whether it's earning money or um uh, delivering passion whatever they want to do they've got to be able to see that that's there and what about any other di diversity areas as, as well you know not just age but uh, gender and ethnicity etc um, would you agree with me that we're not the most diverse again we're not the most diverse as a, as a sector and again I think we need to um, act differently Yes. And I think I think some of that comes back to what I was saying about having inspirational geography teachers, which even now, you know, people go, really? I think I think we need to make sure that that link is made clear to people that if you're interested in the environment, these are the these are the options you might want to look at. And I don't know how clear that is yet because because the environment is almost still slightly slightly new at the moment and oh that's quite popular oh maybe I should look at that how do I do that well you need to look at biology you need to look at geography and I don't I don't know how clearly we're getting that message across and those are the bits where where everybody regardless of of, of where they they are in terms of, of diversity has an opportunity so you know we need to make sure the message gets into schools at quite an early stage I think so yeah. that people have the opportunity to make the right choices rather than getting to 25 and going, oh, that would have been something I'd have been really interested to do, but I didn't I didn't know how to. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Okay, so just thinking ahead for yourself, um, we know a bit about what you've done. What's 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 looming um, over the over the uh, horizon or the hills uh, for you next in terms of projects? What's uh, what's what's getting your juices flowing when you get your teeth into over the next few years? I'm guessing that peatland restoration will continue to be a big thing in Scotland because obviously that's 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 a big carbon issue as well at the moment. So I, I don't see that getting any smaller. Mm. I think from a from a personal point of view, I think my main aim and and this was really the reason why I went self-employed is to carry on doing lots of different projects and to carry on actually doing stuff. So so that was very much my reason for for moving out of the public sector and becoming self-employed because I didn't want to end up sort of in a management role where I didn't get to go out and do the practical stuff. So I really like the fact that I still get to go and do 
do the jobs that that maybe if I was in a in a larger company would be would be put to graduates and you wouldn't get to go and do the peak depth survey or whatever it is. I like being able to do that, but then follow the process all the way through to coming up with the final report, looking at the recommendations, and that's that's a difficult place to get to being able to do that. Um, so so I think my aim is to carry on making sure that that's what I get to do, get to to see different places and see different environments. Mm because that's that's what I really enjoy is having that that mix of of different things and not getting sucked into doing one one thing one environment one one kind of set of things repetitively yeah um and we've got ecosystems restoration as the theme for this year's world environment day um 5th of june if you were chairman of the theme choosing panel in the United Nations. Um, which, is, which is only a matter of time, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I, I was just thinking, I'm surprised you're not already thinking for next year. But um, So there, yeah, what, what would it be? What would be your next theme? What, what's really worrying you about the environment that you feel there should be a global focus to look at it? I think, I think it's actually, a, it's almost more of a social thing of how do we get how do we get the world to focus on the climate change issue in the same way as we focused on COVID? You know, I remember when at the beginning of the first lockdown, I read something online that said, treat this as a marathon, not a sprint. Imagine it might go on for as long as 18 months. And I remember thinking, imagine if we were saying that about the climate crisis right now. Imagine if we were saying worst case scenario, chaps will have got this fixed in 18 months. You know, we, we, we just it's amazing what the world can do when you look at how far we've come with vaccines and, and all this. And I appreciate we've still got a long way to go, but look at what we can achieve. But we can't seem to get that sense of urgency into other things. And I I, I want to know how do we how do we do that? What, what What's wrong with our communication plan that that the world can go flip a neck COVID? We need to panic. I, I we can't do that with climate change. It's a it's a massive conundrum, isn't it? And um, I've heard it said in recent years that it was because the individual felt that they had little impact on climate change. Uh, you know, so these mm-hmm. were big issues they they couldn't really do something about it. Whereas perhaps with um, COVID, they could do something either with their own behaviour or how they interacted with those around them. There was a sort of instant, well, if I do this, I'm told it has an impact. Whereas with um, climate change, it feels as an individual human being that you, literally it's a, it's a drop in the ocean. Um, and I, I, I suspect there's something in that. Do you, would you agree with me that there's something in that psychological approach that people have felt, well, I just, I just can't, I don't think my actions can change anything. I think there is something in that, but on the other hand, when you look at it, when you think about COVID, if I don't, if I don't go to wherever because it's too crowded, it, it's easy to say, well, I don't think that'll change the COVID numbers. And in the same ways, it's easy to say to yourself, well, if I get an electric car, I don't think that'll change climate change. But somehow with COVID, we managed to get everyone to go, okay, so me not going and hugging my granny is probably going to help a little bit. I'll, I'll do that, even though it's personally inconvenient. But we can't get people to do that with things that are, you know, if I get the bus, it's inconvenient. But it might make a little bit of difference. I, mean, I don't really understand why we don't get that. Yeah, although you, you, I, think we do, I think possibly you've pointed out something where they do, where people do get it, where they take an individual action, whether it's recycling a, a bottle or it's changing... Um, a, a purchase, a, a coffee cup, or something. You know, they, a, an individual action is is something they f- feel responsible for. If if I guess that might be it. Maybe if we give people responsibility as opposed to treat it as something up here that's dealt with by politicians, yeah. somebody gets personal responsibility. And I've, what... I've I've seen people who've become way more environmental than than even I am in my daily life about recycling or something and they and they haven't got my background they, they haven't got your background I don't know whether you've seen that so there's something about personal responsibility maybe yeah and there's something about somehow with COVID we've managed to get people to behave to take individual actions and put them together and, and I and maybe that's starting to break down to an extent now I don't know but I think 
I think that's that we've never got to that point with climate change. And I would like to know, I would like to know why. And I'm not a psychologist and I, I, I don't understand what it is that we can't. And is it the time lag? I don't know. Is it the fact that if you hug your granny today, you may see an impact from that straight away. Whereas if you drive your gas guzzler to the shop, you, you don't see an impact from that straight away. I, I don't know what it is, but I wish there was a way. I wish the best psychological minds in the world could focus on how do we get that message across? Because what we can achieve when we set our minds to it is obviously yeah. is obviously pretty impressive. And it's a message to um, the Society for the Environment and Chartered Environmentalists to think about the psychology of what we do as well. Yeah, um, I think it is. I think it is to an extent and not, you know, you know, are we too smug? Are we to check me in my electric car? I'm doing everything, yeah. or or are we not getting that? Are we not getting that message across? Do we get people? Back to, you know, you, you said a couple of things through this interview around things like being too technical, um, making sure that we're accessible. So accessible, technical, um, smug. Uh, uh, you know, um, I think those are all barriers we should try and remove. Um, and also, we do have to. We, we, we do have to, to to walk the talk ourselves we do have to be you know we we can't be out there if, if I go out there and drive around in a massive four-wheel drive and drive you know two miles to the shop because I can't be bothered to to cycle or use an electric car or whatever then then it's very easy for everyone else to go well if she's not doing it I don't have to yeah so yeah I think I think we, we ought to be aware as well without being smug that to some extent we have a responsibility in our our communication is more than just a PowerPoint that we put together. It's also the way that we we act and behave. It's just um, not, I hope not contradic- contradicting that line of inquiry there, excuse me, <clears throat> that line of inquiry around being chartered. So um, obviously, uh, you know, the society is about chartered environmentalists and also um, technical environmentalists as well. Uh, it's about professionalism and uh, linking that to, to qualification. Uh, how important is that to you and how, is, how important is it to also maintain that whilst we become more accessible, etc.? I think it is very important in, within the, the world of work. So I think what, what matters to me is if I'm working on a project and I'm dealing with engineers or people who also have their own process of chartership, yeah that I'm not, I don't want to be there as the, oh, that's nice. She does some nice woolly stuff with planting trees. Isn't that quaint? But she doesn't really have any, you know, it's it's nice, but it's not, it's not, it's not proper science. It is proper science. And so, so having the, the chartered status is a way of, of showing that. But I wouldn't go to a community group in the middle of Aberdeen to talk about, do you want to make your wee burn in the park a bit more wiggly? And say, by the way, I'm a child of development because that's not going to help. They don't care. But if I was talking to the engineers saying we need to work out how we're going to make this wiggly and how we're going to make it work, I probably would be making sure that they were aware that it wasn't just, you know, I, I did have a vague clue what I was doing. And I think the the chartered process helps with that because it's it's something that other people can look at and understand. It's 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 similar across many professions. So I think it's an important thing to have in order that the environment or ecology doesn't become doesn't become just a nice little bit of dusting. Or it'd be nice to put some flowers around the edge, you know. Yeah. Tamsin, thank you so much. Um, I've learned a lot, and um, I can see the passion coming through. Um, so thank you very much for your. Thank you. Work. No, it's been it's been interesting. If you're curious to hear more about the CM for RMP or RM Tech registers, please take a look at how to become and why become recorded webinars on our website, socenv.org.uk forward slash webinars, or visit our YouTube channel, Society for the Environment, where they are available alongside our fascinating webinar series on a variety of topics, including climate change and a sustainable built environment. Remember to like and subscribe. To keep updated with all our latest news, you can sign up to receive emails from us, including our bi-monthly e-newsletter via socenv.org.uk forward slash newsletter. You can also follow us on Twitter at socenv underscore HQ and on LinkedIn as Society for the Environment brackets socenv. If you are interested in hearing our future podcasts, please subscribe to hear more from us. You can subscribe and review through most podcast platforms. To name a few, Apple Podcasts, Spotify or CastBox. The choice is yours. 
Until next time, goodbye.